Eno Badala Show, where comedy meets politics and all things in between. And welcome back, Dean Obidala Show. We're live here Wednesday, November 6th. And look who's in studio. It's Facebook Live. She can People can see it at facebook.com slash Dean of Radio. Are we on? Country music star. Yes, we are, Shelly. This is how it works. Country music star. Much more than that, though. Activist. Uh, one of a pioneer in the LGBT community. Trailblazer. It is Shelly Wright. How are you, Shelly? I'm great, Dean. I'm glad to be, I'm so glad to be back with you. Me too. I, last time I saw Shelly, I saw her in concert for the first time ever in New York at Joe's Pub. Yeah. And you were great, not only a good singer, but you told the patter. What's the what's the term you use for what you do? Because you sing songs, but in between you tell stories. That's a whole Talk? Ge- no, it's a ge- <laughs> no, isn't it a genre? Isn't it, it it's its own little world of you you use a term not song and dance, but like that, but for, for storytelling and singing songs. In any event, you were great. You were very Did was, I? What's the term? You said it and I said to him afterwards, I'm like, that's a whole genre. Uh, just storytelling, singer songwriter kind of. No, that's I not may right. have said I t- may have talked about a bit, like bits between. Yeah, you did comedy. You were very yeah. funny in between. I was like, wow, like you had structured jokes that like, clearly over life. This is these so are your funny st- that you, you didn't have these structures. One, the, one of the funniest people I know that you thought that I was funny. That's that. We were funny, funny, but they were. Stru- I could see they were building the punchlines, and they were. They were structured. It wasn't just like random. Throw them up there. Right. Whatever not, happens. Knock, knock jokes. Right? And. I would tell see Hen, my fiance is not from America, so she knows nothing about country music and and she didn't know and I said, So I told her about you and and, and, and then when you started playing the, the songs I knew, I think the two hit songs I go, right. this is one of her hit songs. Because right. okay. you were doing it acoustically right. with yeah. an accompaniment, so yeah. it wasn't yeah. and she goes, Oh, she goes, I like that song. And there were some other songs we never heard before we liked too. Right. Oh, for the first you. time I came. I was so honored that you you guys Why? Came you out you to invited see the show. me. I was honored to come see it. So and I'm going to hang out. Hen and I are going to write some bits together. She, well, she's working at one person show. Maybe you can help her. She's doing is calling, living with a monster. It's called the name of the show. It's about she living it's with about me. You? <laughs> it's not living with a monster. It's not. It's, not called, <laughs> it's a so working cute. title right now. It's, it's called help me. <laughs> help, Get help me, me out escape. Of here. <laughs> Hashtag free freedom. Oh. The uh, so. You revealed something on Twitter, like you already booked to be on the show, so this is not why you were booked on the show here. Right. You revealed on Twitter something I didn't know that a year ago you had a stroke, and we didn't know this. No one knew this. It was stunning. Tell us, just share what yeah. you want to share about, because you were saying you had migraines. So what happened that was unique about this and alarming? Um, okay, so first of all, I just, I did this tweet, when did I do it? Like last week. Yeah. And then... Because it was the year of the day that I found out I had a stroke. And I just thought, you know what? It just seems wrong to sit on this information. If I have a moment where I can encourage people to Google stroke symptoms, that's a good use of public capital, right? Sure. So I just thought I would mark the occasion. I didn't tell anyone. It, you, only my friends and family knew that, that it had happened. And so I didn't tell anyone I'm going to tweet this out. I tweeted it and then hopped on a conference call. That lasted like two hours, and then my phone just started like going crazy. And then I go to West Virginia to do Mountain Stage, and my manager calls and says, "Good morning, America wants to send out a team, a crew, so to have you on tomorrow." And I'm like, I, "That wasn't the point. The point was just like share stroke um, information with right. people." So, but you and I, and so I haven't talked about it publicly beyond my uh, my tweet. And I've had a lot of folks say, oh, you should get this checked out or you should get that checked out. Believe me, if you don't think I have had a thousand doctor doctor's appointments in the past year, you're so You've wrong. had a lot. Uh, yeah. I have a heart monitor implanted right above my heart um, that's monitored by this device by my bed. There, you know, I don't have a hole in my heart, uh, which is sometimes What did issue. you think you, you I didn't that know. you could have? Well, yeah, that was one of the issues. So oh. I have a cardiology team, a hematology team, like wow. a neurology team. I mean, I've got the best doctors at NYU. And they're almost. all in the control room right now. They follow her they're everywhere. Here. She's got a posse of so, medical professionals who follow her everywhere. Okay, so that that's but the back end it, of it. But the front end of it, you were asking when I got here, like, what what was Tell what us happened? what symptoms... Tell us what you want to share. I don't want to yeah. push you because you didn't go into detail about this Right, much. so... Um, we all kind of know in general terms uh, signs of a stroke, like, right, you can't speak or right. some, you know, numbness or uh, something on your left side or cognitive things. You can't get words out, uh, drooping on your face. Mine was a different kind of stroke than hmm. that. Mine was a cerebellar stroke. So it kind of affects you differently. But in the days that led up to my finding out that I had a stroke, I had I vomited. I fell down in our kitchen. I walked into the wall. My peripheral vision was kind of closing in. I even said to myself in the bathroom mirror, 
I knew something was off. I even said to myself aloud, did you have a stroke? Because something was off. And the night that I, uh, I thought I had food poisoning. The night that I vomited, um, I was kind of, we were, my wife and I were about to go to bed and I just, I got up out of bed and I just kind of, you know, got on my knees in the bed and just, I said, something's wrong. She said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know what it is, but something is really wrong. And she said, do you, should we go to the hospital? Right. And I said, no, I just, I think I just I need to go to sleep. Um, and I, that's what was, you know, that's what it was. And so then you went to the hospital ultimately and you had a battery, battery of tests because right. that was not, because you had migraines, you said, I'm but a, this was yeah. atypical, what happened to you? Uh, well, I'm a migraine sufferer and about once a year, once every 18 months, I do have to go to the ER to, as I call it, knock down a headache. And, really? Yeah, and they give you, and a lot of people who suffer from migraines, sure. you, you just sometimes can't get it under control with the injections you take at home or what have you mm. or the medications. So about once a year I have to go in and they give me kind of a cocktail IV of, um, I think it's like uh, Tylenol, Reglin, was, which is an anti-nausea. I'm not playing doctor here. I'm just telling you what they give me. Um, Benadryl. So they kind of like can get a 10 headache down to like a four and that's manageable. Um, so I, I had, I was on the third day of a migraine and I had shows booked for, for the next, for the weekend. And we went, we dropped the boys off at school and we looked, my wife and I looked at one another and she said, ER? I was like, yep, got to knock it out. Like I had work to do. Um, so we when get When you there. have the migraine, mm-hmm. and it, excuse me for being naive about this, because yeah. I, I, I may have had migraines, but I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. a really had a difficult headache that may have been technically a migraine, but it's not chronic. It's not right, something. Right. When you And I dated someone who used to get migraines, and, and they were bad, but it was not like lasting three days like you're talking about. Is this yeah. three days of pain or three days of not being able to function? Um, it, it sometimes is three days. Uh, sometimes I've had headaches for 10 days before. Uh, everyone's headache is different, but for me, um, I have always just had to kind of power through. Whether I, I can't tell you how many times I've done shows with migraines and people will bring a photo of us together at a, at a show like a year later and I can tell by looking at my eyes in the photo and I can remember oh that was the day I had a, a migraine but most migraine sufferers in the world just kind of have to power through people don't usually have you know the luxury to just go get in a in a dark room right um but that, and the cause is different for everyone who has migraines? Yeah, some some are triggered by food allergies, some are triggered that. by hormonal um, shifts in your body. Um, mine can be triggered by walking behind a cigarette smoker on the sidewalk. If I smell a cigarette that I didn't kind of know was there and I get a waft of the cigarette smoke, it can trigger a migraine. But watching Trump, that's got to, that triggers me. Well, I, 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 I cite him wait. as the cause of my stroke. He that is, and my try- blood pressure has creeped up. In the last, I'm not even kidding. Two I'm, and a half I'm, years I'm, where you. it's gone up a little where the doctor's like, you're right on the edge. I'm like, they go, you have to calm down, which is like the dumbest thing a doctor could say. I'm like, first right. of all, I live in New York. Doctor. Right. Second, Trump is president. How right. can I calm down? There's no calming. Right, now. there's no calming. He's yeah. he's reducing my mortality. I get that. Yeah. But trade-off i'm therapeutically therapeutically trying to work this out every night on the show yeah here so collectively i hope it's cathartic for us and all of us because if not my blood pressure would be if i didn't have this show my blood pressure would be like right. 180 over like uh, sure. 150 or something like that yeah i think the possible, uh, blood sure. pressure collectively of america has gone up and it sounds like some other foreign states as well <laughs> so um but let me just button please. up the um so i had the I had the stroke and then I was learned I had the stroke, but then I had to have a lot of doctor's appointments, which again, my part of my post at the end of my post was I'm lucky to have great medical care. Yeah. Not everyone has that. Right. We got to fix that. So, um, so one of uh, my doc, my neurologist said, Hey, there's a brand new monthly injection on the market for migraines. Again, I've had these my whole life up to 12 migraines a month. And um, he said, we got to get these headaches at bay. That's a, that's a big thing that we have to deal with. So I take this monthly migraine injection called a Jovi. No, I don't work for them. I don't even know who the maker is, but I know it's called a Jovi. The My- segment brought to you by Big Pharma. <laughs> I know, right? My right. headaches on this monthly prophylactic migraine injection have been reduced by 75%. Wow. A Jovi. There are a couple of, there's another one called Amovig. I don't know why my doctor wanted me on a Jovi. It's working. I love it. It's and this is brand like, new kind of medicine? Well, it was brand new on the market as like a month before uh, my stroke. And if year. you didn't have health insurance, I can't even imagine what this would cost. Well, it certainly would have bankrupted my family. And that's exactly what happens to yeah. people who don't have health insurance. Yeah. That, because there actually is for them, I think the cruelest thing are people 
know there's a medication they could take and they can't afford it and they have to make life choices about should we continue having a house or should we pay right. sell this? Should we this? feed our kids or should we get insulin? Or should we yeah. feed ourselves, you yeah. know, our kids, whatever it might be. And that's yeah. the world. That's the rugged, rugged individualism that the Republican Party would have us where the wealthy can have great health care and the rest, right. if you make it, you make it. If you don't, if they die, they die. That yeah. kind of stuff. Well, that's they're, the attitude. They're counting. They're banking on it. Yeah. Literally banking on it. Well, I mean, I, you were great in, in your concert. It's Thanks. so funny because when I saw this last week, I'm like, how did you have a stroke? I mean, I just saw you in concert. You were fabulous and everything like that. And and then I realized when I read it a second time, it was from a year ago. Yeah. And that, so if people, I mean, the classic symptoms for a stroke, and I looked it up as well, it was sudden numbness, sudden confusion, trouble seeing in one or both eyes, trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance, which you had that stuff, yeah. um, severe headaches with no known cause. Yeah. And and that people should, if you have concerns, call your doctor. I mean, because yeah. a stroke, these are the kind of things where a heart attack, people instinctively go to the hospital. Like, I got to go, I'm having a heart attack. Except I, for women. Women don't, oh, don't because feel it. women's don't feel it. Uh, heart attacks present in uh, very different ways. I mean, I cite uh, Rosie O'Donnell had, I th- believe it was called the Widowmaker ho- t- uh, 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 Heart Attack, where she didn't have the typical chest pains. You could look up her story. Mm-hmm. But um, women's heart attacks present very differently. And we, you know, a lot of us are kind of trained to override our bodies and, and our sensibilities about our bodies. So my whole point and. You know, posting about stroke, although mine was a cerebellar stroke, which is a little different one, presents differently. I just wanted to use that kind of year milestone to just encourage everyone to, like, Google the symptoms and listen to your bodies. And that I'm not saying it got blown out of proportion because it it did what I wanted it to do, my post. But um, I'm fine. I'm doing great. The only shows I missed were that weekend because that headache just didn't go away. Um, but I didn't cancel any show. I mean, I've been able to carry on with life uh, pretty, pretty That's great. Per- perfectly. So if I'm you, fine. If you were a comedian, you would be writing jokes about this. As a songwriter, would you write a song about this? I'm not even oh, kidding. Oh, I joke about it. So my friend Rich- Richard Marks is a good talked Richard about Richard Marks him is, sure. Yeah. So he, there was a point into my having the stroke, like six or seven months kind of went by where it's not a funny thing, but you kind of joke about things that are out of your control. So he will text me and he say, hey, Strokey McStrokerstein, how are you doing today? <laughs> like like my friends and family, we've gotten to a point where it's it was so scary at first. I it would was, imagine. Uh, really rattling when a doctor stands at the foot of your bed and, and tells you, you know, you've had a stroke. And, and you know, the doctor left and Lauren was to my uh, the left of my bed and I was sitting there and I'm not joking, but maybe a minute or two went by and we didn't look at one another and we didn't say anything. Then I turned to her and I said, did did I hear that correctly? She said, yeah, you, you've had a stroke. It was so unbelievably unnerving. Um, but again, I'm so lucky. Like, I'm super lucky. And... And I think I told you this last time, Richard Marks, the first CD I ever bought was a Richard Marks CD. And I didn't buy it. I won it in the boardwalk in Jersey because I just got my CD player. And I was nice. A, and won it on the boardwalk where you play a game. And he had a big hit song out there. Yeah. And like was 80s, I guess, right? Right here it, waiting. Maybe. Endless not. Summer Nights. You know You have him, to sing him. You have to sing him. You're a great singer, so you sing him. You should come on and bring your guitar and come I, on I'll and sing and So, in fact, speaking of guitar, you return to the Grand Ole Opry, which if people don't know, the Grand Ole Opry is the equivalent of someone in politics coming on my show. Right? That's how it big, is. That's it's how big it is. Right? So this is it's the, it's the like, mother church This show is the Grand Ole Opry of progressive <laughs> politicians. <laughs> now, the Grand Ole, I think everyone in America, even if you hate country music, you know what the Grand Ole Opry is. It, it is the yeah. mecca it is, yeah, exactly. Of, of country music. It is, and uh, artists who aspire to be musicians in any field, any genre, all hold the Grand Ole Opry in the highest regard. It is, uh, it is. It's it's the mecca. It's the mother church. And I made my debut performance on the Grand Ole Opry September sixteenth, nineteen eighty nine. And wouldn't you know, I, I I went back thirty years later, and they invited me back, and I took the stage on August tenth of uh, this year. And what I read, and there was articles in People Magazine and Rolling Stone about it, it was your first appearance there since you had come out. Yeah. And and why, what, what was the invitation about? Was it a, a, just a normal show? Was it a unique show? Was it a show just about you? Like, I don't know how you get invited to the Grand Ole Opry, so I have no clue. Well, that in and of itself is a giant mystery. Uh, not really. It's The Grand Ole Opry just represents... It's like the, what the MLB is to baseball. It's what the NFL is to anyone who's ever, you know, thrown a football around. It's the 
it's kind of like the validation and it's the place where you go for kind of fellowship among artists and musicians and fans alike and there's a deep profound respect for the history of country music um you'll you'll see somebody on the the same program uh like so the opera goes in 30 30 minute chunks on the radio and on stage and so it each uh segment has like three or four artists on it three or four artists so so it's an exciting ever you know ever changing quickly moving quick moving uh quickly paced show and you'll hear somebody do like a bill monroe song and then somebody else come out and do their number one hit that's on the radio and it all seems to like somehow beautifully artistically coalesce around this de- kind of probably has something to do with you come- and i had to with porter and and so this was part of in fact when my first couple of records came out my first couple of record labels told me stop talking about the grand Ole opry so much in interviews because you're kind of dating yourself you're making uh. yourself seem like a like an old kind of more traditional artist than you are i was like but i love it and then you know of course the opry became even more cosmopolitan and you know more popular as the years went by and i was always invited to be a part of it and really glad to be a part of it um and then when i after i came out and i wasn't invited back it did you know when you did it hurt? It did, but but those things that hurt us as people, and when when you're told you'll never ever get to be like a gay person in church, when you're told you're never ever going to really belong here. Mm-hmm. So at some point, as a gay person who has a faith practice, at some point you might say, "Well, I don't need your church. I don't need your faith." Um, at some point, you know, I think I was talked to myself into thinking, "Well, it's not." that important for me to go back to the Opry because I had a feeling I was never going to get to go back. So I, I, to the point of I didn't even tell a lot of people that I care about that I had been invited back. I was just like going to go do it, bookend my Grand Ole Opry um, lifespan. <laughs> and then I that week leading up to it, I was in Nashville recording and um, I kind of had some anxiety and some emotions and a friend that was there with me said, Shelly, I think that Grand Ole Opry actually, this performance actually means more to you than you're allowing yourself mm. to believe. I got out on stage and I was just so overcome with emotion. Were you? Oh. I read that. You, I read oh. in People Magazine it said about emotional return. It to, was. Did you cry? I did. Oh, you did on stage? Did I you did. tell the audience? Oh, they saw. <laughs> they no, saw. Did, you, did you talk? Because I saw your one show where you talked yeah. to the audience a lot. Did you tell them? I haven't been back here since I came out. Did that come up or no? Or they go oh, like, yeah. okay, Shelly, you can come back, so, but don't ixnay on the gay nay stuff, all right? Just right. go out there and play so a little song. when I walked off stage, much to my surprise, there were a lot of people in the wings who were surprised that I kind of went there on stage. Oh, so I, you did say it on stage. They thought, I think people thought I was going to go out there, sing you know, a couple of my hit songs, and then just be able to say, I did it. The gay me walked out. <laughs> but I didn't. I talked from the Grand Ole Opry stage about... Being an 18-year-old and how that first time that I took the stage at the Grand Ole Opry as I walked off the stage in 1989, I really swear to God thought to myself, I may never get to do this again because I might be found out. Hmm. And every time I took the Opry stage from that day forward uh, during the you know highlights of my career, I always wondered, is this my last time? And so I shared that with the audience. And I was very emotional. I made it through uh, what I had to say. Um, but and it what was, was their reaction? I have to tell you that the, you know when when you do the opera, you can see a lot of the crowd. It's because it's um, they're filming, and it's mm-hmm. you know it's kind of like a like a TV studio, and it's a beautiful. And I saw pictures gorgeous. of it, and, and thousands there, and it's a of video seats. of you there, right? It's yeah, beautiful, beautiful, and the sound is great, and it's live on the radio. But I could see the audience, and there were clearly some fans who had come there to in support of my being hmm. out and on the Grand Ole Opry stage. But for the most part, it was your run of the mill. Grand Ole Opry audience, which is, I don't know the demographic exactly, but it's 35, 39 to 106. I mean, it's there are some older people there. And I, as I was talking about my gayness, it did, I did have a moment where I was like, I'm about to talk about being gay on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry. And I looked out and I saw, you know, people clapping and I, for the most part, people were looking around at one another like, I'm clapping through this. But there were a few people who didn't clap, who stopped clapping. <gasps> like, what? When I, yeah. One of those. And so my guitar player, Eric, a few days later, he said, we were talking about that because the band could see it too. And he said, you know, how did that feel? Did that hurt your feelings? And I said, you know, yeah, a little bit. I kind of felt 18 again. Mm-hmm. I felt, you know, you want the affirmation of your fans. And, he's, and he said something really profound to me. He said, Shelly, 
what you did for those people who stopped clapping when you talked about being gay. He said, what you did changed them. And I said, how so? And he said, at some point, the you know 20 or 50 people who stopped clapping had to look around and see everybody else clapping and had to wonder, am I the only asshole here? That's right. And, and that it, moves the needle. It does. That's how cultural norms shift. Because yeah. people yes. see things and they get a sense, everyone's going a certain place and I'm not. And I can be the Rick Santorum of this and be, right. I'm going to stay with this and, and Mike Huckabee and those, but the rest are moving forward and leaving behind. And then you're alone. And then that's how things shift, even for not them, for others around. And they go, if it was cool with her, who cares? Yeah. And that's what was so, what my main takeaway. And I actually now think I'll go back to the Opry. I feel like they made me feel really welcome. And Can I, I open for you? You I do may. Five, see how they like Muslim. And up. folks, guess what? I'm a Muslim. I'm not gay, but I'm Muslim. What do you think of that? Don't push it, Dean. <laughs> Come on. Don't push it. <laughs> They're like, and I could boo him. Like, oh, you're okay with the gay girl, but not the yeah, Muslim guy. Right. Come on. What's wrong with you people? Baby <laughs> steps. Baby <laughs> steps. But I, I really, I think I'll be back and, and the you know the folks that invited me to come out to the Opry they couldn't have been lovelier and they were like we love you so much and I was so glad that's to be back. beautiful but but that thing you were talking about cultural cultural norms being shifted I actually I came out almost ten years ago it was the first time where I actually saw change happen right in front of my eyes it's remarkable in fact. Before we go to commercial, let's play a little bit. I'm, I saw this in Rolling Stone, so I'm hoping this is actually from the Grand Ole Opry performance, but I think it is because it looks like the beautiful setting. So let's hear the clip of, of Shelley. I was crying through that. Shelly was yeah. fighting tears here. Yeah. And, and from Because you were crying while you were singing that. I was. So that's why Shelly got emotional here, because you could hear that. Mm. Oh, wow. That was a, yeah. that was one of your big hit songs. Shut Up and Drive. Shut Up and Drive. hit record. Hen uses some of that phrase towards me, just not the drive part. <laughs> Shut up, Dean. <laughs> Shut up, Dean. All right, let's go to a quick break and come back with more of our friend Shelly Wright. Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. And now, more of the Dean Obidala Show on Sirius XM's Progress. And we're here with Shelly Wright, 
talking about life, my friend. So, Shelly, <laughs> you come from a family that is religious. We've talked about this before. Yeah. Very, are they evangelical? Uh, yeah, we went to evangelical churches. My, They weren't the most hyper-religious in my community, but definitely, you know, we had a bunch of Bibles in the house, and they were they were the go-to book. Do you know Paula White? Have you seen Paula White? Here's Paula White, folks. <laughs> this is from now. This, so there's some music underneath it. She's one of Trump's biggest supporters, apparently a big, I don't know if she's a star in the evangelical movement, but she is, certainly gets a lot of hits and, and watches mm-hmm. her. She's, uh, I'll let her speak for herself. Here's clip number eight. Wherever I go, God rules. When I walk on White House grounds, God walks on White House grounds. I had every right and authority to declare the White House as holy ground because I was standing there, and where I stand is holy. To say no to President Trump would be saying no to God. And, and I won't do that. We are in a spiritual war right now. Let every demonic network that has aligned itself against the purpose, against the calling of President Trump, let it be broken. Let it be torn down in the name of Jesus. I am one of the demonic networks that have chosen to go against Trump. And in the name of Jesus, wants to end I'm this show. I'm in on your demonic network family plan, apparently. <laughs> so... <laughs> What do you, hey, look? This woman has apparently got some following. She has some connection to Trump. She invokes not much different than some of the other, like Reverend Jeffers and yeah. Falwell and these guys. Mm-hmm. Somehow, somehow, Jesus Christ and Donald Trump are synonymous. I don't get this. Maybe I'm missing it. As a from a devout Christian family, when you hear this, does it? Do you think this can resonate with the old? Family member is back there, or uh, some. I, first of all, I don't think she. I don't. First of all, she's going to have to meet her maker at, at one point. So that's she's got a, she's got a lot of things to answer for, as 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 we all do. But um, I don't think these people who are propping Donald Trump up as God's uh, divine choice for America, I don't think they believe even a, a tenth of a percent what they're saying. I don't think they know that Donald Trump is a subpar human being. They know he's a liar. And he's a grifter. And, uh, you know, they're pack animals. He's also cruel, which is in opposition to what Jesus Christ teaching. He demonizes the, the least among us as opposed to helping those people. He's the least faith-filled person I have ever experienced on the planet. He, <laughs> he was once asked, does he pray for forgiveness? He said, no, I've never done anything to forgive for. To, to, to ask for forgiveness for. I don't, I really don't believe that these people in the faith community that are, you know, that are going to the White House and laying hands on him, I think they're, they're looking at the means to an end. They're, they right, want, right. they want faith to be, to reign supreme in our administration and our, in our policy making. So they think, let me hook my wagon to his star because he's talking about faith. Um, I think probably very few of them actually uh, adhere to the values and principles of people, uh, true pe- people of faith, of any um, denomination. But I don't think they really believe that Donald Trump is chosen. But you they know, want in on that power. I'm on record as saying that Tom Brady's the devil. It's something I've said. Do you know Tom well, Brady is. from the Patriot? The f- right. Well, so, yeah, I'm a Chiefs fan. I, right. So I, I think Tom Brady, and I could have a serious discussion with people about this. I think he might actually be the devil. But... The thing is, I think Trump might be close because they're friends, and it right. makes sense the devil would have evil friends. They're pack animals, right? I'm telling you, these people who love power and love uh, divisiveness, they're pack. Now, I don't think that Tom Brady is the devil. I can't go with you on that. I do. Um, I have incredible jealousy. I do think he, I think he lied about Deflate Gate. I think he threw a couple of equipment guys under the bus. Doesn't age. He, he doesn't age. Wife. Right. But remember, like. I turned on him when he came out to do that presser about Deflate Gate in the little stocking cap with a ball on it. Do you know what he was doing to us? He was manipulating us. Like I'm so cute, and this, not even taking this so I'm seriously. An I'm an L. I'm like the boy wondering, look how cute I am, and this is so not important to me to do this presser. I've just got a stocking cap on because I don't even take this seriously because you guys are crazy. That that's when me, you turned on him. That's when I was like, oh, he did it, like. He's As a, Muslims, we say Satan. I think he's. Is Nina here? Isn't that is a Nina? food? Satan. Isn't That's that how food? you say the say. devil, right? In Arabic, I think he might be. 
Shaitan. Nina's back, by the way, folks. Did I, did I say it last night? I don't know if I said... I love Nina. Shaitan is the song. Shaitan, say it again, Isn't Nina. Shaitan. I think Tom Brady might be Shaitan. Nina's back, by the way. You started this week, uh, and you. we're so excited to have her back here. The team, the band is back together. The band is back together. Nina and me Matt, and Matt, we're yeah. the backup singers to Nina, and yeah. that's how it works. I, I, I will bring my guitar next time. You should. Oh, I, I'd love to see Nina sing. By the way... It, it, there's a poll recently. 30, only 39% of Americans in this poll approve of Trump. White evangelicals, 77%. This is a recent poll. 77% of white evangelicals. And forget everything else. If Jesus stood for one thing, it's compassion and caring and helping those. Like in Matthew, you were thirsty and I gave you something to drink and you're a stranger I took you in. And he is opposed to all of that. So forget everything else. Just for that alone, I cannot believe how any Christian, any true Christian who believes in the teachings of Jesus Christ could support this man because he is the antithesis of that. And I know he's giving you Christian Sharia law. And you want That's to, what they want. You want to oppress women. It's, all, it's, I get the, it. it's the but judges. Come on, it's the courts. There, there's got to be a priority in your faith. The teaching... Jesus didn't talk, as John Fugel saying, Jesus didn't talk about right. abortion, but he talked about caring people for in need, the least among us, helping them. Yeah. That should be love your brother like you love me, your, the people you meet like their brother. I'm yeah. destroying yeah. the Bible here, but I know that because I went to Catholic school, that part of it. And, you know, he said, hey, if you see somebody, you be nice like, to them. No, he's like, if you see he's like a Jersey guy. Something. Hey, you know, he's Help like, hey, out. if you see a guy and he's okay guy. That also be, sounds be cool like my Jewish father-in-law. That so was my time too. So, <laughs> all right. The, when you see... He interviewed Chris Matthews. He's on right now. He's going to yeah. play tomorrow night. I talked to Chris. He said yesterday when I interviewed or two days ago when I interviewed him that about Trump supporters. And he said in a respectful way, when people hear it tomorrow in context, they'll get it. He was not demonizing Trump supporters. We just talked about, is there any chance he thinks they will peel away? And he compared it to religion. He said, I, I don't. He didn't call it a cult. He wasn't dismissive. Yeah. He said, I see it like in a religious affinity because he's a very devout Catholic. Right. And he said, I see it like a religious affinity where people are very, it's about faith. And it doesn't matter about facts. And faith transcends that. It has to be yeah. usurp that and make it. And that's how he sees it. And so when we talk about religion here and people the most devout, and at least their view, these white evangelicals, who like Trump, it seems that they have interchanging Trump and Jesus actually makes sense if they're blind loyalty. Because you would never question Jesus. Right. It, um for me, like you go into a church and you know how certain artifacts seem sacred and people, you know, that statue is up there or that cross and like everybody knows that it's made of like pewter or wood or, right. but that doesn't matter. It becomes the sacred thing. And that's what they know. They know that he's made of, you know, nonsense. They know he's a bad person, but they don't care because he's iconic. He's a, he's a representation of what they how they want our nation to be led um it's all about the judges it's all about the the appointments that they're pushing through and that's why you know uh, mcconnell and lindsey graham they they don't want to look at the transcripts they're, i know they're i played just, the clip earlier lindsey graham no, i'm yeah. not going to read the transcripts i don't facts will make my brain hurt so yeah so i don't really think that the evangelicals think he's a good person or that he's faith filled right. or that he even has a faith practice i think it's uh, but boy uh evangelical evangelicals kind of authenticity their metal as faith uh people of faith is really being tested it's pretty easy to see look uh, i i want in the long term how this hurts the evangelicals for people who are outside that community and the way they view them because i saw polls where younger people who had a negative view of evangelicals and that yeah. was a year or two ago and yeah. it was a lot because the demonization of the lgbt community that's why that was happening now with trump and if you're evangelical, I don't think you want Trump as your poster child because it's not helpful to your cause. Right. I've got to be honest. Well, and they also know they've, again, hitched their wagon to his star and they don't know how. So I, I liken it to drunk uncle like got really drunk at the barbecue and we gave him the t keys to the car. Now nobody, nobody can get near the car to get the keys away from him. Drunk uncle's just screaming, it's my car. It's well, my know, car. Get out of my way. Hashtag my car. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay. Give me another beer. I so, mean, they have empowered him. They built this monster, and they can't disarm him now. If if Trump drank alcohol, some of this would make sense, what we're going through. But he doesn't. <laughs> That's that the worst part. The He's sober doing this, or at least not on alcohol, because I think there are times there's something going on. 
whatever medication, yeah. he's got prescription medication for things. Maybe it just doesn't work out well, the measurements. I'm not sure. I'm not trying to get his head because I don't really care what's in his head. Well, you know, he broke into uh, his doctor's office. He and his thugs broke into his doctor's office and stole all, all of his medical records. Right, right. I remember York. something like Did that. Did I tell you about the time I had an, an hour-long conversation with this doctor and his wife? No. Oh, yeah. So um, I was I live on the Upper East Side, and I was walking on the sidewalk, and I I saw his doctor, Born, Bornstein. But the guy with the crazy hair? Yeah, look, right. standing on the corner smoking a cigarette. And I walked like a 10 paces back him, past him, and I stopped, and I turned around, and I just... I said, "Why aren't you speaking up? What he? What he and say? We, we. He's a really nice guy. He and his wife. We ended up talking. I went into his office and we talked for like an hour. Um, and I, I said, you know, is it true that Trump came in and had his thugs steal all of his medical records? And he was like, Yeah. And he took wow. other medical records that didn't belong to him. Like, like Trump is. He, they're scared of him. They're afraid of him. So but my question to him was, why aren't you speaking out? And you know, why didn't you say that you didn't sign that paper? And he said, well, I didn't. I didn't. I'm basically, I, I mean, I don't want to go into all of it. Sure. Um, <laughs> but his, they're scared. Also, I ran into Sam Nunberg on the street a couple of months ago. And this is, you're not, are you following Trump officials no, around? Are you, no, but. Did and you just I, run into Rick I, Perry last week and I Mick Mulvaney as no, well? No, I tweet about this. I just had dinner with Mick Mulvaney. That was kind of weird. I didn't expect to be at his table, but I, I never sat there. disclosed publicly that I talked to uh, Trump's doctor, but what I did. What did Sam Nunberg, he looks like he needs help at times. Yeah, I think he did. The troubling reason things about him. I noticed him on the sidewalk is, you know, the guy that like wears workout clothes but then stops and lights up a cigarette without like moving over on the sidewalk I have on, an idea. Your, you know that guy so like i was like this guy this jackass is like impeding traffic i'm trying to walk and he stops and he's smoking lighting up a cigarette and i'm like you're in workout clothes so i turn back to look at him as i pass him to kind of give him a little stink eye and and i look and i saw so it was him and i stopped and i looked at him and i said you and he said yeah it's me and i said he said, Sam Nunberg. I said, oh, wow. I know who you are. He gave his name? And then we talked for a little bit. I said, what are you going to do? Did to you go to his office? Like no, the doctor? Okay. No, we stood on the side. He was actually uh, v- very willing to talk to me for about 10 minutes. I said, what are you going to do to undo this And fiasco? what did he say? He said, "He's gonna, Trump will be his own undoing. He said, he said, you know, basically. Can you talk to others in the Trump circle and come back in the show and report to us what you found out? I'm, I'm like a roving a sidewalk uh, j- journalist. You are. You're the like the, the reporter for the Dino Budala show, Shelly Wright, coming to you live from 67th he, and 2nd he, Avenue. I'm here with Sam Nunberg. But, but he follows. So I, I tweeted him, thanks for talking to me on the sidewalk. And he follows me now and I follow him. But um, I, he seems to think Trump will be his own. Well, I think he's doing everything. He, Trump, if he didn't have these enablers, if the Republican Party was about America and our Constitution and not defending Trump, they would have probably made a plan B to get Pence the nomination for 2020 and get rid of Trump. But instead, they've attached themselves. Because they're terrified of him. They're terrified of the base. It's not him. He has no power, per se, really. It's about He'll his power is getting to the base. Yeah. Right. And so they'll get primaried. But that's falling apart, as we saw last night. It is. And... You know, Julian Castro was on a week ago and made a good oh, point cool. that he's a very nice guy. He's been on several times. I like him that now. he thinks things can change once we get past the primary season for Republicans, that the ones who are worried about a challenge from Trump might speak out. I'm not sure it's going to happen. I think that was a fair argument, but we're talking yeah. that's way in the spring. Impeachment trial and everything will be over by then. All right, let's take a quick break, though, Shelley. Come right back with more of our friend Shelley right, right here. Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127.
to the Dean Obidala Show on Sirius XM Progress. And welcome back to the Dean Obidala Show. We're live here Wednesday, November 6th, coming up in Louisiana. A white supremacist rally in a few minutes. I mean, a Trump rally it's coming up. So check it out on Tucker Klansman. Watch it. Watch it if you're white. You're going to enjoy it. And that's, that's true. He's Tucker Klansman. I call him Tucker Klansman. Why don't I get booked on Fox News? Maybe because I call him Tucker Klansman in tweets and everything. I don't care. That's He is a white supremacist. If the hood fits. Exactly. Nice. So 2020 race, before I read your tweet about double standards and everything, just give me your sense. What are you, what are you making now where you're less than three months from Iowa? Well, if I had my druthers, as we say in the South, sure, I love Kamala Harris. You do? I do. Um, I uh, have been kind of thinking for the past couple of months that uh, Elizabeth Warren will be the nominee. Um, Pete Buttigieg is like, so, God, just to have him represent our country. When, when the, you know, Notre Dame was on fire, like he addressed the French people in French. Like to have a smart bright, service-minded, you know, mm-hmm. um, guy uh, or gal in the White House would be incredible. Uh, I think it's going to it's gonna get dicey and tense, but we better get our shit together. We better make a decision soon. I tweeted, my last tweet of uh, before I saw you tonight was, uh, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders will not be the nominee. We need to move on. Like, it's not going to happen. Why, why do you say that, that dismissively? It's just not going to happen. Why are you being so sexist? Well, why am I being sexist? <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, okay. No, but why? T- do it one at a time. Why Joe Biden is done for you? I like Joe Biden as a person. Um, I, you know, I really will always and ne- always appreciate, and never forget that he kind of nudged President Obama in- into LGBT, right? Exactly, uh, affirming right. us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love him for that. I think he's a nice man. I think he's done a lot. I think it's time for us to not have a white guy and uh, a white straight guy. And um, Bernie Sanders had a heart attack. I don't know if anyone knew yeah, about this. Yeah, but he's this. doing great now. Come on. Uh, no. That shouldn't be the reason to be against That them. is the reason. Why? Because it will be weaponized against us. Hillary had a cough. And the, you know, the evangelicals and the, the I right. I think that's you fair. Know. Bernie's back and better than ever. Okay. I mean, physically. I'm just saying the debate. Like, if he was, t- if he was frail in that debate. If I thought you were not going to like him because of his policies, that would be different. Well, I don't appreciate uh, what he did to dismantle Hillary Clinton at the at, he he once he didn't get the nomination, he it took him too damn long to get out there and stump for her. Too damn long. That's a different reason. I'll never That's forgive fine. him. The health also, he had a heart me. attack. It will be weaponized. I I really appreciate that he's moved the needle toward liberalism and progressive ideas. I really do. I think he's a really decent guy. Um He's not going to get the nomination. If he gets the nomination or if Joe Biden get the nomination, I will make a I will I don't I'll cook you dinner. I don't cook. I don't know. That's not really right. That's like right. You're, 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 um, I will make no. a, a nom, nominal uh, donation to a charity of your choice. Thank you very much. I don't know what the organization will be. But look, I mean, there is a chance one of those two get the nomination. I'm not advocating okay. for either one. The what do you think of, of Mayor Buttigieg? Do you, I mean, you just said nice things about him. There yeah. are some people who have called here not the biggest fans. I know some person I won't say his name who is an activist in the LGBT community that doesn't like him either for his mm-hmm. own reasons. I won't share why. Yeah, and I was surprised by that. So yeah, what what what's your view of him? Uh, we have to have the African American vote, and I was. Um friend of mine, Billy Mann, su- a super good friend, super great singer, songwriter, producer, um, <laughs> is really uh, into Mayor Pete and had Mayor Pete at his house and said, Shelly, I'm telling you, I had President Obama at my house before he wow. was n- nominated. I'm telling you, this guy is our guy. And I've just been pushing back to uh, to Billy. I don't think Mayor Pete is the guy. And I based it on the fact that I'd been in Texas and I had inadvertently stumbled upon a faith leadership, worship, kind of symposium of African-American women, faith leaders, and some about 300 congregants in a room in Texas. And I ended up, I was in workout clothes, I'd gone for a walk, and I stood in the back of the um, ballroom and sweaty and gross from my walk, and they invited me in. And I said, no, but I'm in sweatpants, and everybody else was in hats and decked right. out for Sunday morning. And they invited me in and took me up to, there was one empty seat at the front of this ballroom at this one table. And I sat down and just immediately was welcome. They fed me and I listened. Wow. And it was it was a really powerful moment to kind of be a part of and to be welcomed into. And I understand people of faith and I always want to understand more different cultures and faith. And 
I knew in that moment I left. I actually took a program and called Billy when I got back to um, to New York, and I said, "We got to get on a plane and we got to go see these female faith leaders in the African American community because they're not on board with Pete." Did that He's come not, up. Pete by name came uh, up. A discussion. Uh -huh. um, pr uh, part of what I was hearing in the um, faith worship and the singing and the speaking was about values, and I knew in that moment. If they knew that I was gay, that would probably go over like a lead balloon here. Back. The, um, look, I mean, but but I knew in that moment right. this is the this we need these women, and if and Mayor Pete doesn't have these women unless he That's can get these women. It's interesting because over ninety percent of African American women voted for Democrats in twenty sixteen. In fact, the number one demographic of all demographics that support Democrats are African American women, followed by African American sure. men. Yep. If you were to lose either one of those, we could not build a coalition to win on a national level. That's interesting. I, I will also say, we just so to, it's clear, we, people who if people who are conservative Muslim are probably going to have a problem with Mayor Pete, just like someone's conservative Christian, regardless of their skin color. So I don't want to make this about that. It's because they're black. It's about, because I had this conversation with Jamira Burley just two nights ago. She was here. It's about older people who are religious are going to perhaps have the most problems with someone who's gay until you until they don't, until something until, changes. And and part of that, and, and if I had a chance to be back with those women again and I have their information and and I, you know, there, there's, there's going to be some contact there, but I have to go share my story with them. And Mayor Pete is going to have to do that. And it, it's not the responsibility of black women faith leaders or their congregants to um, to get Donald Trump out of office, but it's it's uh, not lost on me that we have to have their support. And mm -hmm. Mayor Pete, there's, there is, um, those two, the, the communities have not coalesced yet. There, we have to move the needle with storytelling, much like I had to come out in country music and I was the first one to do it. Right. Um, stories have to be told in the black community about people like me um, because they're, they're, you know, it's a part of the, who they are. They just aren't talking about it as much as we need to. The, we're going to take a quick break, come back and talk a little bit about the double standard. I'll play a clip from SNL from Saturday about Liz Warren. And, and Bernie, and it's not a slap on Bernie, it's about, in a way, it's a subtle dig at sexism. heard Dean's thoughts. Now it's your turn. 866-99-SERIOUS. 866-99- right, so Shelly, you were tweeting about so tired of male journalists and pundits continued analysis that Dems have to pick Biden because he's electable and tough enough to take on Trump. A gentleman, you're... You're the reason we're in this spot. You gave Trump a free pass, but beat the shit out of Hillary Clinton in 2016. Did I say that? You did. You I had cursed. a stroke. I don't remember. <laughs> that. <laughs> no, that, that's fine. So, no, double standard in coverage. In fact, here's from SNL this Saturday just past. Kate McKinnon playing Liz Warren. It's a subtle call out of sexism. It's a funny clip anyway. So let's hear clip number nine, please. Who's got a question? Who's got a question? Hi, I work for Kamala Harris's campaign, but I'm still undecided. I'd like to know, why did it take so long for you to release your plan to pay for Medicare for all? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you um, for bringing up health care. That is my despacito. Um, you know, in the last few years, the number one reason families went bankrupt was because of health care costs. Even the people who had insurance. It's a tricky little corn maze, right? But when Bernie was talking Medicare for all, everybody was like, oh, cool. And then they turned to me and they said, fix it, Mom. And I'll do it, I'll do it, because that's what moms do, right? <laughs> you know, with Dad, you eat birthday cake for breakfast and then go to Six Flags. And then I hold your hand while you throw up in my purse. <laughs> right? 
So the subtle point was there on Bernie's Medicare for All. Oh, isn't that great? And mom fixed it, sort of like, Mom, right. how are you going to pay for it? Because they were hammering her. And I don't remember any hammering of Bernie about because Bernie right. would just be like, I'm honest, we're going to raise some tax in the middle class. And we goes, yeah. okay, we're done. I guess he's being honest about that without yeah. knowing the rest of it. On paper, everything is paid for. In reality, yeah. it's a lot of assumptions, economic assumptions. It's difficult. And there's no way to really know how you're going to pay for it. But her, the point, that little subtle moment was like, why am I being held to the standard uh-huh. to do everything and while dad can get away with the bad things, no one cares? Exactly. And we saw it play out in the, you know, who runs most of the newsrooms, uh, men, um, and most of the journalists uh, that, you know, sat down with the candidates were men. And I think they all thought, and I think, you know, I probably thought it too, there's no way Donald Trump, this clown, is going to win. Right. So they thought, you know, let's be extra. Let's just, you know, as I said, beat the shit out of Hillary to make sure everybody knows we did our jobs. But then they just, they damaged her to the, and she can't beat the our press and Russia. Right. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just, I'm, I've really just had it with the... I just that's a great but now sketch. We're all, but now we're all aware of, of that. Too. We all collectively call it out. I've said it to journalists on my show from in a nice way. I might say it to the face of Eamon Mohadeen on MSNBC. We yeah. had a conversation. I've said it to Candace Gibson. I've said it to Katie Turr and right. Jacob Serberoff and others. I've talked to about the media just being like, everyone's going to watch you guys really close this time. Yeah. And if you do anything, we're going to call you out. So don't take it personally. We're concerned about our country. We saw right. it happen in 2016. So, yeah. But we're running out of time, my friend. Shelly, where can people follow you on Twitter to read about more updates on your campaign, your, uh, your, where you're traveling, where you're going, where you're performing? I'm Shelly Wright. That's C-H-E-L-Y, Wright. And um, you can find me online. Just Google Shelly Wright. Shelly, it's so great. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for sharing so many stories, especially about the Grand Opera. It was a beautiful story. Thank you. Shelly cried a little. It was nice to be here with him. Nice moment. We'll be right back with more of the Dino Bidala show after this.